Okay, with this, we have got, uh, we are in time, uh, are almost in time to start the next session, which is the lacrimal session. And uh, most respectfully, I would like to call to the chair as chairman, Dr. Jayanta Das, sir. Please take chairs. As co chairman, Dr. Jatinda Bali, sir. Dr. Rajan Anand, sir. As co convener, is already on the dais. Thank you, sir. And Dr. E. Ravindra Mohan, sir, is the moderator. And as for the speakers, I would uh, like to know if Dr. Nidhi Pandey and Dr. Anesha Sarkar are around. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So we have all the speakers present, and I think we can start hand over the session to the chairman, sir. If you'd like to say a few words. Your first day, first show, we have five speakers. Can we have the list of speakers? Or can the speakers please put up their hands? So we have two. We have, we have five speakers Dr. Gyan Bhaskar, Dr. Ravindra, uh, Dr. Ravi Ranjan, Dr. Nidhi Sarkar, Dr. Anvesh, Anesha, and yourself, sir. <laughs> so all of you are present. Yeah. That's fantastic. 100% attendance. <laughs> day one. So is there a particular order that we need to follow? or? So there is another one. Who's the moderator? So this is this is going to be you know uh, a lot of it is going to be on the fly. Open and uh, so we have our first speaker, Dr. Gyan Bhaskar, and he is talking to us about step by step management of a failed external DCR. And uh, after him, the next speaker is Dr. Nidhi. Dr. Nidhi Pandey, are you ready? Okay. So, Dr. Basco, over to you, sir. So, do we uh, have discussions after each uh, each talk, or should we hold them for the end? Okay. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Chairman Scientific Committee AIOS and LOC, Bihar Aptanuga Society, uh, to be present here and discuss on the topic, very important topic, particularly I can say, the step-by-step -step management of the failed DCR. Basically, I have taken uh, can, this can, case. Can you please reset? Sir, so just a minute. Can you reset the clock? Can you reset the ticker, please? Timer, Timer reset. Kar do Ye one minute, 55 seconds. Bol raha hai Zero seconds. Zero seconds. So, okay, we have seven minutes for each talk. And so that, me that means 35 minutes are talks. And then we have 20 minutes. So, I think, uh, sir, please. Start, kare, sir. Uh, basically, uh, uh, DCR is one of the most common oculoplastic surgery we perform in our day-to-day -day practice. Uh, basically, we fear to do the DCR because of the bleeding and unpredictable outcome. Particularly in the cases of failed DCR, uh, everyone is fear to do kya hoga nahi hoga. So, it is frustrating for both the surgeon and the patient to deal with the failed DCR. Uh, on base of the uh, base literature, the success uh, rate was uh, vary from 70 to 95 percent. Some people reported 95 to 100 percent. And some people uh, are reported very low because of the uh, under reporting as also very important part. Basically, we are not reported the case where the cases was failed. And the functional EP for us would also include it in the failure because of the only not anatomical failure is the failure, but the functional uh, EP for is also uh, the failure uh, should be included in failure. And of course, the learning curve is a very important part because the beginner can have a more failure rate than the expert surgeon. Uh, uh, first of all, you have to know the uh, what are the causes. Based on the literature, there are so many causes in the endoscopic DCR, the external DCR. The most common causes are membranous obstruction, and it varies from the uh, uh, so failure rate was uh, already uh, uh, success rate was not, but the failure rate of five to ten percent in external DCR, 
20 to 40 percent. But nowadays, with the advancement of the endoscopic surgery and uh, machine, the certainly the failure rate uh, reduces. Uh, particularly on analysis, what are the causes of failure this year? On the based on the literature, the published literature, LVPI, who mostly saw that the failure rate was mostly due to the inadequate ostium. Uh, or incomplete sac municipalization and psychiatric cell closure of the ostium. And there's a long list of the uh, uh, etiological failure, this is psychiatric cell closure, so many lists, we, we have to know the causes, all the causes of the failure rate. Uh, in where we are going to deal with the failed this year, the assessment uh, should be clear and SKD should be plan, think, plan and manage. Uh, management based on the basically uh, when uh, the patient came with the failure uh, rate. Uh, we cannot wait longer than the other surgery because patient when complain the uh, uh, watering or discharge, so we take the earliest as possible when the fibrosis uh, and edema resolve. And uh, most important point is the endoscopic finding. We have to uh, assess the uh, nasal, uh, muco um, nasal mucosa and, uh, and also very important part is the counseling the patient. And the decision is based on the when we are going to do surgery, uh, external or in endoscopic, based on the expertise of the surgeon. Here a patient is reported with us of LDCR uh, after the three month, uh, 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 three band back uh, patient was operated for the good uh, DCR, but the patient kept with the uh, watering and required discharge. Patient was treated, uh, syringing and probing, but again patient complained with the discharge on examination where the uh, regurgitation of the fluid uh, just uh, uh, the see here the incision was given uh, along with the previous scar or uh, just inferior to the medial uh, purple ligament and blunt dissection was carried out uh, uh, to uh, 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 just to see here that the uh, of course there's the fibrosis and bleeding is more in the uh, failed this year but uh, with the blunt dissection uh, we try to release the scar tissue and find out the pre previous ostium was made. Uh, with the help of the spatula and sharp spatula, we uh, want to uh, localize the any anatomical landmark mostly in the uh, bone, uh, bony part and the previous ostium. Uh, so, uh, there was a uh, lot of fibrosis, uh, then fibrous. Uh, uh, tissue was uh, released by one by one uh, by di blunt dissection and with the cut with the uh, spring scissors and we localize just to see here just we we'll, uh, find out the nasal bone on the upper side and there was the mucosa uh, just to see here the bone uh, bony and uh, there was uh, the ad adequate ostium was made and we try to insert the spatula beneath the uh, ostium. Uh, that then after we try to cut the nasal mucosa which was previously anastomosed with the sac wall and uh, some of the fibrous band was also released in the inferior side. Just to see here the nasal mucosa was cutted and pulling the uh, uh, nasal pack so that it makes it to help uh, we can assure that we are in right path and also it maintain the hemostasis by uh, uh, and then the posterior wall of the uh, uh, nasal mucosa uh, cut it out and again we try to find out the in, uh, cause of the inferior side of the blockage, where is the exact blockage. Uh, uh, in cases of the failed disease, just to see here, there is more of the fibrosis, but uh, even uh, the release of the fibrous tissue and just I am uh, cutting that the, uh, to visualize the more visual of the posterior part. Just to see here, there is the uh, uh, bone, there is a uh, uh, just to see, this is the sac was visible here and uh, on the viscoelastic material, we uh, just uh, viscose come out from the sac wall and bone was still intact. Either it is due to the not cut it previously or it is due to the posterior fibrosis. Then we make another uh, uh, sac uh, flap on the sac, anterior and posterior, and posterior sac was dissected uh, properly and uh, to uh, preserve the anterior, sa uh, anterior sac wall. Uh, it, it is very slow because uh, we, are, we don't want to lose our interior part of the sac. Uh, remaining posterior part of the sac was uh, dissected uh, properly. 
uh, which is covering the anterior uh, sac and you see this is the uh, this is the uh, bony bony portion the, the, and again we uh, try to make enlarge the ostium with the bone punch so that the ostium should be in front of the common colloculi. The, uh, the most important part is the ostium creation is in front of the internal common colloculi. And uh, uh, just uh, you see if uh, uh, lacrimal bone uh, uh, pushes in, just you see, visualize, you can see the internal common opening and now uh, the ostium is in front of the uh, uh, internal common opening. And again, then uh, anterior and uh, posterior uh, nasal bone and, uh, sorry, nasal uh, mucosa and the sac wall is again re most to each other. So keep in mind that uh, it should be not too tight, otherwise it will be uh, uh, cut through or too loose. Uh, just uh, in the upper portion, uh, I'm taking the nasal mucosa uh, along with the sac wall with the some uh, muscle fiber so that it give the strength and uh, extent, extent and uh, tenting to the uh, tenting of the sac so that it will not uh, uh, lose uh, posteriorly and uh, the risk of failure should be minimized. Uh, so I believe we're short on time. I think hmm. Thank you so much, sir. Then after the anastomosis of the sac, skin, muscle and skin was. Uh, in cases of fa uh, failed DCR, uh, we should implant the mitomycin C intraostomally or uh, keep in mind that point, uh, 0 0.2 milligram per ml should be implanted or 0.02% for three minutes. Uh, generally, we wash the saline, but uh, in cases of uh, uh, DCR, we, it is not necessary to wash the mitomycin C. Thank you so much, sir, for your patience hearing and... Uh, so we will be discussing this in the end again. Okay. Yeah. Very nice presentation, sir. And now we have Dr. Pandey coming up. Yeah, Dr. Nidhi, what? please come up for your presentation on endoscopic lacrimal procedures. So are you, are you using mitomycin C with the endoscopic procedures? So a very good morning, uh, very good evening. Um, it's uh, indeed an honor and privilege to be talking about lacrimal procedures in the very first AIS midterm conference. Thank you for the opportunity. So coming from external to intranasal view, let's talk about endoscopic lacrimal procedures. Why I've used this graphic is uh, akin to uh, the quintessential uh, magnifying glass in the hands of a clever sleuth. Uh, the endoscope acts like a magnifier to reveal uh, hidden anomalies and hidden mysteries of the lacrimal apparatus. Let's see how. Coming to the diagnostic aspect, now it's become a routine to perform an endonasal evaluation before planning any kind of lacrimal procedures to reveal any abnormal anatomy or intranasal pathology we cannot, which cannot be picked up with an external examination. Like in this adjoining picture, we see a septal spur. Similarly, during the recent MUCA crisis that our country faced, in a standalone eye hospital like mine, the only solution we could give was referring the patient to a multi-specialty setup. But a view with the endoscope gave us sometimes the first clue in the diagnosis of mucormycosis, where the patients were sometimes RT-PCR negative with very minimal symptoms. So this was uh, what was shown was a typical feathery appearance just taking a swab and mounting it on a KOH mount revealed the fungus. And <coughs> in th that way, our endoscopic view was the only clue that uh, suggested, uh, that made us uh, find out, that made us diagnose that this might be a case of mucormycosis and refer the patient appropriately. 
coming to the like, criminal procedures, uh, now literature is flooded with uh, evidence about how the intranasal view gives an edge over routine probing, probing, especially in cases where a buried probe is there, where there's a nasal intranasal cyst, where a good and proper management can only be done with the clear view of the intranasal anatomy and visualizing the probe inside the nose. Also, the possibility of doing DCR in patients with recurrent acute acrocystitis, in interposing a conjunctival uh, uh, bypass tube and seeing whether it's appropriately placed, and also correcting concurrent septal deviation is only possible with the help of an intranasal view with the endoscopic DCRs. Now, a routine probing now is uh, recordable so that it acts like a document and a proof, not just for ourselves, but for the patient. Like we see, now we get CDs in any laparoscopic procedures. We can think about providing CDs to our probing and DCR patients now that we have the choice of recording it. Also, the intubation is safer, quicker, and less traumatic. Citing an example, this was a nine-month-old baby who was having recurrent infections and the swelling in the medial canthus. What we imagined it as a routine probing turned out to be something different. So this is the routine probing that we are doing. After having uh, probed the sac comfortably, we felt a soft stop when the probing was complete. So that's where the importance of viewing the probe inside the inferometer comes in. Now what we saw was, so this was a hump where our uh, probe was going and the light was reflecting off the cystic, uh, of the wall of the cyst, so this was an intranasal cyst. Now we passed our probe past the cyst and then marsupialized it with the help of a crescent blade. So just piercing it wasn't enough, it's never enough. We have to marsupialize the cyst to prevent recurrence. And this, we are using a crescent blade to make a cruciate incision and marsupialize the cyst. And then the duct was patent. This is a gush of fluid. Coming to a routine endoscopic DCR, contrary to popular belief, we are away from angular vein and there's no possibility of hitting the angular vein when we are going from the nasal route. So bleeding is in fact, uh, the occurrence, uh, the chances of bleeding are in fact much less in endonasal DCRs. So this is how we lift the nasal mucosa, punch out the bone, confirm the sac with gentle pressure, then tent it with a probe and make our incision vertically, open it up like a door and after mucosa to mucosa uh, opposition, we can either leave it like that or put a tube. So this is the mucosa to mucosa opposition and I'm intubating this patient. Let's come to the next uh, indication where sometimes we come across with flimsy or early uh, common canalicular obstructions after DCRs, those can still be salvaged by interposing a bicanalicular stent, and that is possible very easily with the endoscopic view. So this was a post-DCR uh, patient who was having common canalicular narrowing, and we stented this patient, and it worked out successfully. Let's see some complicated case scenarios. Now this was a dog bite patient with a severely scarred medial canthus. There was no question of uh, being uh, able to establish any patency in the existing lacrimal system. The only option left to us was a bypass tube. Uh, we chose a silicon bypass tube which was cheaper and although it was functioning very well, it was patent on uh, every follow-up. The patient always complained about irritation and forearm body sensation and then was lost to follow up for another seven to eight years only to return with IOPs in the range of 40 millimeter Hg because he was constantly putting steroid eye drops for his foreign body sensation. So we convinced the patient to uh, go for a replacement. Since the uh, ostium was already formed, the bypass tube was already in place, all we needed to do was uh, pass, uh, pass a metallic probe. I think this is not playing well. Let's come to the next slide pass a metallic probe inside the existing ostium and slide over our uh, borosilicate tube 
upon it, and this is the post-op picture after one month where it's uh, snugly placed and patent. And this is the diet disappearance test of the same patient. Similarly, this patient had recurrent tube erosions. We didn't have access to endoscopic uh, console at that time. And we were wondering <coughs> why every time her Jones tube is uh, getting extruded. Finally, when I was confident in uh, endoscopic procedures, I discovered that my tube was wrongly placed. It was hitting the med uh, septum. And that's why it was ex getting extruded. Now with the help of endoscope, we did perform an external procedure, but we confirmed the position of the tube endoscopically. And this is how the patient uh, did after one month of follows, uh, follow up, where the tube is snugly placed, and the flaws and diet disappearance test is <coughs> patent. Here's the tube. Can you? Uh, yes. So just uh, one more indication is again a, a scarred uh, medial canthus where the bypass tube was lost on follow up. We did an uh, Z-shaped Z-shaped inc inc incision for correcting the canthus scar. Placed the tube, but after one week of follow up, this is the first procedure. But after one week of follow up, the tube wasn't found. But just one glance with the endoscope helped us in retrieving the tube and replacing it with the proper sized one. So this is how we retrieved it back and replaced it with a proper sized tube. And this is a video at final follow-up of one week where the tube is snugly placed. This is how the patient looks now. He, I've made it a routine to confirm my distal kind of uh, cut end of canaliculus endoscopically after seeing the annular fibers. I also pass the probe and uh, through it and look for the probe in the inferior matrix just to confirm whether the distal end which was appearing on the micro is actually the distal end. Let's skip to the final slide where post-operative, we can, we can, we can uh, assess now? our post-operative findings by. Sound check, can, can, we, can we conclude ma'am? Yes, this is the post-operative findings where we see a closed, uh, closed ostium and uh, ostium which is about to be closed and this was the one which was patent and it's not working. What an irony. So I would like to conclude this uh, talk by saying that it's uh, endoscope is an indispensable tool for like ramen procedures nowadays. Yeah, Thank we're coming so to that. Uh, the next talk by Dr. Uh, by Dr. Jayanta, that's fantastic presentation. Can we have a round of applause for her, please? <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Pandey. And now we have Dr. Jayant Kumar Das, who is he's, he's going to talk about external or, or endonasal dec uh, DCR, a safe approach to a final verdict. Who better than him to talk about this? And can we have people come up fo forwards? We have all the front seats lying vacant. I know we were all backbenchers there, back in college. Come on, this child party is coming. Please come forwards. We have enough seats no, here. No, yeah, 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 oh, yeah. Please. Definitely. Uh, just open it up. We make it uh, endless. Okay. Just a very good thing is that Dr. Gyan and Dr. Nidhi make mind that work very easy, and from their side they are telling, I am just a compiling boat. Ex ex really there is a lots of things, so what should we prefer, external or endonasal this year? Which one safe? That's a, another one. Proposal for earlier endoscopic this year was, it was a highlighted, it's a scar, there should be any scar and it will be from the nose and it will be very easy to Motivate our female people, uh, female population. Excellence still, uh, external is still gold standard, but. So those initial advocacy was there is a, there should be no skin incision and uh, there should be no scar. But in, the Dr. Nidhi rightly mentioned, that is the senses of there is a, we, should, we can avoid to injury angular vein, not only angular vein, sometimes there may be a, accessory angular vein or there is a tributary of accessory ex uh, angular vein or that is a mess, those we can avoid. Both the systems are in equal, even the first endonasal decrosystomy was first performed by Caldwell in 1893 uh, also, but he just stopped it and then he can switch over to the external one basically. But what are the disadvantages with the endonasal or endoscopic basically? Infrastructural costs, 
steep learning curve preferred under GA. That's a, one of the biggest problem in our country. It should be done under GA. Most of the time, it's very, very difficult to perform under LA. And assistant dependence. Sometimes that is a, we, either we need a big uh, thing, good monitor, or that assistant should in a the assistant should be in a uh, little bit more experience than in external this year. In endoscopic, as Dr. Nidhi rightly mentioned, there is a point somewhere. Uh, can I can I sort it? Make it enlarge, make it full screen. Then I can cut short my video. Make it full screen. This one full screen. Yeah. So no, no, full screen. Can I go go fast forward? <laughs> full screen, huh? Full screen. Ah, no, full screen. I have many or I see. Yeah, how many? Honestly, I can cut short it. Yeah, he separated it. PBS is one. There is some technical issues there. Yeah. Yeah. Video hmm, video tiki hai. Passport. Focus cut the end of the end of slide end single slide focus end of the 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 if there is end of membrane, I want to show that it will be very difficult to fill all the membranes by endoscope. But in case of a external, we can feel it very nicely. Sir, I think, I think, sir, it's coming quite. Yeah, play kar dijiye directly. Kafi bada aa raha hai, sir, on the screen. I think we can see. So once there is a membrane, once there is a membrane in such cases, so it will be very difficult. Then we can just uh, with the instrument, we can remove it the membrane. But it is little crude matter. Do is a endoscope. That is one of the little disadvantages in endoscope otherwise it is okay fine so rest of the things are same so of course in endonasal uh, in uh, external there may be some in those are having a cellulitis there may be some scar like this but not in all cases need for endonasal definitely there is a need is this if there is a recurrent attack or if there is acute decrocystitis, but the incidence of acute rule, true acute decrocystitis is less. So that is in preferably in in my practice, like those type of patient. Those type of patient we can go for a either we can go for abscess drainage, but frequently we may need several times for abscess drainage. In such scenario, through endoscope we can drain it out and we can do the. the endonasal this year in the same sitting with or without intubation. That's <coughs> another biggest advantage with this. Recurrent decrocystitis, of course. Culture and sensitivity. If we can do the culture and sensitivity and at the same time we can do the surgeries, but sometimes if, as Dr. Nidhi already mentioned, if there is a, it will be difficult as bleeding point of view and if we explore more and more areas. Nasal part is generally not too much inflamed as compared to the, our eye part in a lead area or that in an angular area. So we can treat that thing accordingly. Various studies have shown better outcomes in terms of um, uh, functional benefit with external this year approach, but both are same. I want to just uh, highlight one point here. I can show you this is Salado video. 
here just a play this so here in external we can go for a so in external is like a standard one nothing but if it is a enlarged big one then we can expose it and I will show you in हाँ इसी में है उसको वीडियो डायरेक्ट खोल दो था डायरेक्ट लिखो लो डायरेक्ट लिखो लो फोल्डर खोल दो फोल्डर खोलो अब हो जाएगा आप चलेंगे सर I'm sorry we'll we'll have to make do with this late नहीं कर एस्केप करो वहीं से चलाओ उसको एस्केप कर कर तुम्हारा डायरेक्टली यहाँ से यहीं से चला दो चला दो ऐसे बताइए ना। Okay, then in external, that's why I was saying come forwards। आप पीछे वाले को किसी को नहीं उठने देंगे। सुनो, सर आइए। Video directly on करो। Pointer है, laser pointer दो सर को। So that's a here I want to say that's <coughs> sorry for that it is a small projection it is here it's big but he is the technical team is unable to highlight it and uh, that's a membrane so yes that's membrane we can remove it initially but in endoscope that membrane is not possible because it was through indirect way it is indirect way and it is not here we can magnify the membrane and we can cut the membrane that's one of the biggest test thing we, I'm, I'm cutting the membrane and we can feel all those membranes and I will show you later on that this is that I, I am just dissecting that breaking the step four or five times there is a cellulitis then we can intubate and we can direct visualization there is a advantage of direct visualization. As Dr. Nindhi rightly mentioned, in such cases, there is a sunset of lacrimal um, uh, angular vein injuries are less, but if we control the hypertension, etc., then very nicely we can uh, control it. Regarding one point is that about the CPA, Con um, the Consumer Protection Act, as we are ophthalmologists, so my always practice is that if I do any endos endonasal DCR in equit also, I always one of my surgeon, either as a second surgeon or a assistant, whatever, not exactly assistant, should be an ENT surgeon who avoid consumer protection act. We don't know what will happen. <coughs> so that's another. But all surgeons, all ophthalmic surgeons, blood shop are now very, very confident to do. But for that's a another issues only because in why it is we may in trouble during that uh, under the CPA because in our medical council and endoscopic is not in our curriculum in AOS not in our curriculum OPI, Oculoplastic Association of India or any other organization it is not or any NGOs is not included that's another big vital point for those are doing so technically if I do something so if I am doing also I'm planning so I just a uh, one of the co-surgeon is my through ENT surgeons MS or DLO from ENT background of it so that's I want to highlight on few points can any individual society protect from our law? No. 
that's a another issues so those are the points otherwise we can do there is a no such point that this is better endoscopy is better in some cases not only scar point of view it is a direct visualization one of the disadvantages if there is a membrane as i am want to show you if there is a membrane by direct ophthalmoscopy we can bleeding of course one of the issues but another issue is just the cost factor in our country that cost is I think Nidhi also preferred, is it? Are you preferred ZA or LA? Yeah, that's another issue. Yeah. Yeah, under LA, that visualization is a little difficult, and patient cooperation is always complaining of pain. Yeah. Yeah. Why so those? That's a another very very big point, and most of the most of the surgeon, renowned surgeon, all everyone wants ZA, but due to the lack of man manpower and others, anesthesiologists wants to refer. Oh, uh, this year, okay, they thought it is a very simple, but it is actually major surgery. Everyone, everyone in every OT it was mentioned. It is a minor OT. As a oculoplastic surgeon, I always feel very bad once there's someone label it as a minor. Sir, thing. can we continue the discussion? Yes, sir, definitely is my last slide. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Sir, for positive time, now I would like to call uh, Dr. Ravi Ranjan for his presentation on double trouble, corneal ulcer with dacrocystitis. Uh, good, very good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my topic for today is double trouble, a corneal ulcer with dacrocystitis. Certainly, you know financial relationship to decalia. Uh, and the aim of the study was to ex explore corneal ulcer with dacrocystitis, and the necessity of its management is the treatment of corneal ulcer, and vice versa. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bailey. Uh, this is a retrospective and non-controlled case, non case series from August 2017 to 2021. And uh, as yet 13 cases from th 13 eyes from 13 patients with corneal ulcer with dacrocystitis was included in this uh, study. And uh, clinical diagnosis uh, of corneal ulcer, as everybody knows, and uh, I added just OCT of our anterior segment and uh, lacrimal duct obstruction by irrigation examination of the lacrimal drainage system was performed immediately after the positive diagnosis with medical treatments and lacrimal irrigation examination consisted of punctum dilatation, lacrimal sac massage and syringing with commercial available moxifloxacin eye drop to determine the point of obstruction and uh, gender, gender distribution was uh, four male cases and nine female cases, total 13 cases I have taken. And uh, organism isolated from uh, three from male patients and from se seven female patients, total 10 patients, I, uh, organism was uh, positive sample was taken. Uh, distribution of uh, different isolates were staff in five cases and uh, streptococcus species in nine cases and the uh, rest of two one two one year and the uh, antimicrobial susceptibility pattern of various bacteria isolated in my cases just i want to highlight one thing the ofloxacin is lesser sensitive than ciprofloxacin in my study against stf aureus And uh, after diagnosis of corneal ulcer and dacrocystitis, patients were initially treated with topical broad spectrum antibiotics uh, or uh, antifungals in anticipation of bacterial or fungal infection because I belong to rural areas and my main patients are from agricultural fields. Uh, and uh, after diagnosis, drugs and eye drops ointment were given to the patients according to their clinical and pathogenic diagnosis. Corneal debridement and uh, BCL were applied and treatment of chronic dacrocystitis is DCR uh, after corneal debridement and BCL. Uh,
Oh, good. Uh, usually, I do. Usually, I do this year by a small flap saving technique, which I have developed from uh, 3,000 cases. And the outcome is after medical treatment, corneal debridement, BCL, DCR, and ulceration was progressed in first week. However, after three to four weeks of DCR, infection was controlled and corneal epithelium healed. And final outcome was satisfactory. And these are the few cases and uh, before before healing and after healing. These are the few cases, example of few cases. And the corneal ulcer is one of the major cause of monocular blindness, as everybody knows, and second only to that of cataract worldwide. And it is also one of the most common medical challenge in the developing countries, including India. And the known pathogens of corneal ulcer, as you everybody knows, bacteria, fungus, virus, protozoa, or parasites. And in rural India, fungal corneal ulcer is still one of the major intractable diseases, composing an unusual high percentage of all of all type of corneal ulcer due to lack of antifungal eye drops and poor knowledge of uh, antifungal medicine and injudicious use of steroid by quacks, uh, especially parimon, that's what we call parimon, especially in the clinics of the vast rural areas. Uh, Banerjee et al. all have reported the chronic conjunct conjunctivitis due to lacrimal system blockage can be relieved by DCR. And the ocular surface of healthy individual normally has a microbial flora, most commonly a, a small population of bacteria, typically coagulase negative staphylococci. And under the normal condition, this microbial flora may help to exclude harmful pathogens, maintain the immune response to the injury, and make the ocular surface a peaceful ecosystem. And however, when this balance is broken, the normal microbial flora would change. And because lacrimal duct obstruction might destroy the tear film dynamics, delay microbial clearance, change the normal microbial flora on the surface, and make cornea liable to be influenced by, infected by gram-positive and gram-negative organisms. Although numerous studies on how to control and treat corneal ulcer have been reported previously and the relationship between corneal ulcer and the order the neighboring tissue organ such as chronic dactocystitis is still ignored in many cases because the blindness may be caused by complication of corneal ulcer and lacrimal duct obstruction while association between corneal ulcer and lacrimal duct obstruction is uh, still ignored by scientific communities and i have conducted this uh, study to evaluate the effectiveness of treating infectious corneal ulcer with lacrimal duct obstruction and uh, inconsistent with the previous uh, studies, the most common obstruction point in our study was lower canalicular occlusion, and the high risk of lower canalicular occlusion could be secondary to ocular inflammation due to corneal ulcer, and toxic effect of topical medicines might increase predisposition to lower canalicular obstruction. And to best of my knowledge, on one hand, lacrimal duct obstruction may delay tear film clearance change the normal microbial flora and make cornea liable to the infection. On the other hand, corneal ulcer may promote the obstruction of the lacrimal duct, especially lower canalicular obstruction. Thus, it is important to make an early diagnosis of lacrimal duct obstruction for corneal infection control. And this is my first cases. We presented with uh, left eye, eye ache, redness, congestion, and photophobia lacrimation. That's why my dedication to the study to this patient. And the take home message is evaluate lacrimal duct obstruction in conjunction with the treating corneal ulcer. Because in many cases, patients are with photophobia, uh, foreign body sensation, and uh, very uncomfortable. And they, and uh, most of the time, we do not go for, um, uh, go for examining lacrimal duct and lacrimal area. These are the references. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ranjan. That was a beautiful presentation. And uh, we, have for, we, have, we are short on time, so I'm calling on Dr. Anisha Sarkar. And uh, she's going to talk to us about one of the first ever cases which have been documented of this condition, Burkitt's lymphoma of the nasolacrimal system. Dr. Anisha, are you ready? Yes, sir.
Good afternoon, respected dignitaries. My case is a 16-year-old maid who presented with watering a discharge from the right eye for five months. He noticed a swelling on the medial side of the right eye, which is painless and gradually progressive in nature for the past five months. We did a careful external examination, which revealed a non-tender firm swelling at the right side of the eye over the lacrimal sac area. Ropless was negative. Other anterior segment and posterior segment examination was all within normal limit. So with this, we came to a provisional diagnosis of a right-sided mucosal, started the patient on oral tetracycline and requested for a NCCT orbit. NCCT orbit revealed a hypodense lesion in the area of the right lacrimal sac extending to the NLD into the inferior meatus. And also to our su surprise, we found a heterogeneous mass lesion in the left alveolus with surrounding bone destruction. Uh, so a careful examination of the oral cavity revealed a swelling in the left oral cavity, but the patient had no history of hemolacria, no history of fever or cough or weight loss, loss of appetite, no history of immunosuppression, and no palpable lymph nodes. So is it a malignant lesion? With this, we did a fine needle aspiration cytology from the left upper alveolus and the histopathology was suggestive of malignant small round cell tumor and also a histopathology from the right nasal mass was suggestive of malignant small round cell tumor. Immunohistochemistry uh, showed CD45 positive, uh, CD20 positive, positive, CD3 negative, TDT negative, and also BCL2 and BCL6 were positive, all of which was suggestive of Burkitt lymphoma. The PET CT scan showed increased uptake at the left maxillary sinus area, at the right lacrimal sac area, and also at the left pterygoid muscle. However, no intraorbital extension. CSF analysis, bone marrow aspiration showed no evidence of malignant cells. We referred the patient to the uh, oncologist. Uh, he was uh, treated with a reduction chemotherapy of cyclophosphamide, vincristin, prednisolone, followed by an induction chemotherapy. At the current visit to us, we can observe the mass lesion over the lacrimal sac area has resolved. Lesion in the heart palate has also resolved, and the patient only has complaints of watering and discharge from the right eye now. Coming to the discussion of my case, Burkitt's lymphoma is a highly aggressive B-cell non-Hodgkin lymphoma derived from the mature germinal or the post-germinal B-cells, occurs due to rearrangement in the MIC oncogene, and it is the fastest growing human tumor with a doubling time of 24 to 48 hours. Less than 5% of the cases of non-Hodgkin uh, lymphoma in adults, but accounts for over 40% in childhood. However, the uh, survival is very good, over 90% in uh, children and over 70% in adults, present, uh, normally present as a rapidly growing tumor with very quick dissemination, and therefore 70% are diagnosed at a very advanced age. The most common site is the ileocecal region in abdomen followed by the head and neck and present with tumor lysis syndrome. The histology has a characteristic starry sky appearance. They are positive for CD20, CD79A, CD10, and BCL6. However, generally negative for BCL2 and TDT. The mainstay of management is chemotherapy. Rituximab-based regimens have shown improved survival rates. A quick review of literature. A West African Journal of Medicine has studied 260 patients of Burkitt's lymphoma. Uh, 43 had uh, orbital tumors, out of them 79% had unilateral tumors, 21% had bilateral. Few case studies had also been reported. Uh, uh, first one is a seven-month-old male ch child who presented with a facial and periorbital swelling. MRI showed subperiosteal infiltrates in the facial bone, base of the skull, and frontal and temporal bones. Next is a 31-year-old female who presented with a painful proptosis in the right eye uh, came out to be a case of orbital bucket lymphoma. CT scan showed uh, lesion on the medial rectus muscle. And the last one is a 24-year-old male with a very aggressive 
Burkitt lymphoma of the orbit presented with a large fibrile exophytic mass from the right orbit. Exenteration was performed and HPA was showed starry sky appearance. The take home message from my presentation orbital presentation of Burkitt lymphoma is very rare and to the best of our knowledge there is no current literature which reports a nasolacrimal involvement of Burkitt lymphoma. So we have to look beyond the ordinary. Burkitt lymphoma is mostly diagnosed late and in a very disseminated form but timely diagnosis, timely referral to the oncologist and uh, is very essential as chemotherapy has very good results. Thank you for your attention. So endoscopy it is very uh, difficult to uh, localize and visualize the and so uh, most important part is the uh, to find out the ostium sir uh, it is rare uh, just in my cases the ostium was uh, up to mark but above the entire uh, lacrimal crest that's why the maybe the failure co uh, cause of the failure. Ma'am, this is being rec this is being recorded. I think we'll we'll carry out these discussions later. Uh, one one small question from the three from the panelists. Uh, what are your recommendations? When to use mitomycin C? What concentration? What time? Yeah, meal in is yeah. It is a this year is a big surgery. Either in a failed cases, either you can choose a mitomycin C or the silastic inhibition. Both are good. Advantage of mitomycin C is that it is a, and uh, there is a no such a chances of granuloma formation. If patient is prone to granuloma or some scar formation, then in such cases mitomycin C. Otherwise, in failed cases, I prefer silastic inhibition. The concentration are you can go for little higher concentration as like a trap. Or that uh, use mitomycin C use for PREV also up to seven days we can use to cut to for a cost effective one. That's another thing. So there's that a in the evening we started uh, immediately Yeah, and we just uh, need a task one minute and we can thoroughly wash it.
from the area, from the areas. That's another point. Because in eye trap, we are using for mitomycin in the eye areas only. But here we are in the near the nasal mucosa. That's a very important point to use for mitomycin C. So I think we're done with the session. So uh, the take home messages, of course, are. Uh, please evaluate your patient very carefully. No harm in uh, an endoscopic evaluation, at least, of the ostium for a failed DCR. Make it as part of your routine practice for failed DCRs, the evaluation at least. And then, of course, mitomycin C versus elastic, that is up to you in your practice. Just endoscopic, not only. It is an essential part of that evaluation. Always, always endoscopic. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, and we conclude the session here. Over to the next session, people. Thank you, all the speakers and chairperson.